Introducing the Little Green Seeding Machine. This tool can help you seed your microgreens up to 300 trays per hour. With all this extra free time you'll have, you can spend it growing the business with sales and production, or you can spend more time with family and friends and less time on the farm. The Little Green Seed Machine works with all of the most common microgreens varieties, including pea, sunflower, radish, brassicas, mustards, amaranth, basil, and so many more. This tool seeds much more evenly than hand seeding, reducing disease risk while also increasing the uniformity of your crops, and do it twice as fast. Pre-order your Little Green Seed Machine today and join the microgreens revolution. Hey guys, today I'm at Greenbelt Organics in Ontario, Canada. This has got to be the most automated uh, farm I've ever seen. There is so much technology here, so much innovation. It's so, so cool uh, how robotic and automated uh, this farm is. And on top of that, the high quality of product they're growing. They're really focused on soil nutrition. It's a completely certified organic operation. And most importantly, Ian is one of my uh, inspirations for starting Living Earth Farm, seeing him grow microgreens uh, in his past business and seeing how high quality that product was really inspired me uh, in the methodology I used in Living Earth Farm. So I'm really excited for you guys to meet Ian and excited to show you this really cool facility here at Greenbelt Organics. Hey Ian, thanks so much for having me at Greenbelt Organics. It is crazy how massive the scale of this greenhouse is. Um, but I'd love to start just kind of getting a background of how you got into farming and uh, and how this how Greenbelt Organics became what it is today. Okay, um, this is actually my 30th year in the greenhouse business. Uh, I started the farm up in Stouffville, um, growing uh, hydroponic basil. Uh, I won an Ontario Science Award for um, for hydroponics uh, back when I think when I was 10. Uh, my dad always had a green thumb, but he also happened to be the Dean of Food Technology at George Brown College. And he said when I was launching this idea, he said, well, if you're going to grow anything, grow basil uh, for the chefs in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad had given uh, one of the chefs uh, after he had retired from, he became a consultant as well as a, a food critic. And um, back in the day, Pronto was the top restaurant in Toronto and Brad Long was the executive chef and uh, my dad gave him a Michelin star and the next year I walked in with a big bunch of basil and said, hey, you gonna buy my basil? And he's like, why should I? And I said, because my dad gave you a Michelin star and he's still a friend of mine today. So That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So That's cool that you have such a, a, a deep background from when you were like 10. Yeah. Um, and most people may not know, but like you've been a huge inspiration for me and developing the methodology at Living Earth because of your focus on quality and uh, just like organics and really focusing on soil nutrition, mm -hmm. which I think is surprisingly rare in the CEA control environment agriculture space. Yeah. Um, so it was just great to have you as like a, like a leader in the space that could really inspire me to like I mean, I used to go to health food stores and see your product in the store and be like, this is what I want to replicate, not any of these other brands that were there. Right. This is what I want to develop it on. So, and you know, I, I, organics to, to us, you know, hydroponics, um, um, unfortunately, miserably failed for us in that we had uh, fusarium wilt in our basil crop. We had root aphids and I said, man, there's gotta be a better way. Uh, yeah. And that's, that was the discovery path of organics. Um, and not that organics isn't challenging by any stretch. Um, but it is a differentiator for us in that um, anybody can grow with chemicals. There's all kinds of great books and people that know how to use chemical fertilizers and all that. Um, but the reality is you don't grow as uh, nearly the quality of product yeah. with the shelf life that you can with producing organically. Our lettuce tastes like lettuce. Our arugula tastes like arugula. Um, and uh, they can't duplicate that in a hydroponic system. Uh, yeah. Their lettuce wilts compared to ours. Uh, we got you know minimum of a 14 day shelf life. We're actually pushing 18 now. Um, yeah, obviously we have some technology to preserve that process uh, that hopefully you'll see later. We have a crazy pack house down there. That, uh, our, our lettuce is literally chilled within four minutes and in, in its package, chilled wow. and in its package within four minutes. 
the best that California can do is four hours. Wow. Yeah. So, that's incredible. Yeah. That's um, like, because because once it, once it starts the cold chain, it starts preserving it. Because once you cut it, yeah. it's if not a living plant anymore. Exactly. It's, it's dead. So yeah. uh, the, the sooner you can get it cold, the slower the breakdown yeah. process. Exactly. And then the, all the vitamins and nutrients, especially the vitamins, because those are the ones that break down the fastest, the fastest. Yeah. Uh, are going to be intact mm -hmm. much longer. But yeah, like I, I buy your arugula from grocery stores in, in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, yeah, you're totally right. The shelf life is insane. Yeah. I have some that's, it's got to be over two weeks old. Yeah. And it's just starting to yellow. And that's from my fridge, not from when it was right. bought from, or, or not when it was uh, cut. That was when it was bought Five from a grocery, grocery store. store. Yeah. So, and then the, like quality wise, like next level for yeah. arugula. Like the stuff in California has not even close to the flavor complexity and spiciness and just like the crunch yeah. that, that it can have. Um, so, and you know, one of the things that I love about my job is that I get to invent all the time. Um, there is no CEA in the world that can produce arugula en masse profitably. No. Wow. Um, and I was just in Holland two weeks ago and um, uh, having the conversation with the breeders. Uh, they know how important arugula is, just like they know how important spinach is in the CEA space. Yeah. Again, can't be done yet. Yeah. Uh, we're working on it, but tough nut. Uh, but anyway, arugula, uh, you know, one of my favorite plants, but... Um, the reason being is that it doesn't put on enough density for its weight and seed. Um, so, you know, with lettuce seed, you know, we're looking at 55 to 75 kgs per square meter per year. On arugula, we're approaching that. Wow. But the seed cost for a table here from these guys in Holland is approaching $60 in seed. Well, the arugula seed probably costs all of, I don't know, $4? Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. So... They're going to have, they said, well, what if you get 100% germination? I said, well, I got 98% yeah. germination and you want to charge me $20 a table in seed? There's no, the economics aren't there. For developing new varieties sort of thing. Yeah, but yeah. you're not, the, the, the limiting factor that for arugula is the, they want to grow it hydroponically in a gutter system so it can complement a lettuce product got it. in the same facilities. Yeah. Well, when you're growing in a gutter, um, with the, like call it a soil block dropped into a gutter. Those are most of the systems that are out there or a jiffy plug that's dropped into a gutter. Um, that's the differentiator in our facility is that we actually figured out how to develop soil into the most common table system in the world. Uh, so from a cost of um, production standpoint, this is the lowest cost system in a moving table system in the uh, in the trade. Yeah. So yeah. all the gutter systems that are all fully automated and the gutter gets advanced down the greenhouse and then sent to the pack house, uh, this facility would, it would add another $10 million to it. Wow. And yet, so 10 million over the cost of a table system, you know, this table system would have cost, call it 5 million. Well, now you're now talking $15 million yeah. in just capital palace to do the gutter system. And with the gutter system, you can't be certified organic because, yeah, because there's volume. not enough soil volume. Got it. Yeah. Right. And, and I guess that'll depend on your location. That's in Canada, in correct. the U.S. as well. Oh, so in the U.S. you can grow hydroponic organic. Yeah, yeah. Which it's is, kind of ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. you know, I've tasted the Revol Greens, the biggest producer in the U.S. Uh, their organic uh, lettuce. It's it might as well just be hydroponic. hydroponic yeah. 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 I uh, know a lot of people are doing that. Like it's high, it's organic, but they're really growing it with the high hydroponic methodology. Yeah. Because in a lot of ways, the yields can be higher yeah but then what i've noticed is that there's a very direct correlation with quality absolutely and if you're like focusing on building a soil so that's where i think it it, it just from i think of producing food from the perspective of like what's going to actually nourish people because yeah. you're just producing like volume mm -hmm. but it's not actually giving people the nutrients to you know like grow and live their life. life like it, yeah. it's like what is that really food or is that what, what it like i don't exactly. know it, it's it is food because you're getting calories and yep. some nutrients but it's like the way i've always thought of it is, is you, you maximize the nutrition in the food then you're actually doing a service to society and growing the food yep. whereas like if you're you know growing stuff and it doesn't have much nutrients in it then it's it's just the same old it's not really advancing Ag civilization or agriculture, agriculture. Yeah, yeah absolutely so i've always been a firm believer you know Flavor, you can tell when something tastes good. I'm not a fan of strawberries, because to me, strawberries don't taste good. The stuff that comes out of California is terrible. Uh, you know, some CEAs are getting better at it, 
But, you know, the University of Guelph is doing a bunch of research with organic strawberries. And the guy that we do research projects with the University of Guelph, so he's here on a regular basis monitoring our compost piles. Anyway, he brings us strawberries and they are to die for. Wow. Like to die for. And it's wow. like, I'll eat that all day long. Yeah. Because I, it, chances are, and they will be testing the nutrient density of them as well. Guaranteed. Yeah. They're twice as nutrient dense yeah. as the California stuff. I totally agree. Yeah. And, and that's exactly the same premise that we do here. Grow a really good quality plant. It tastes good. Guaranteed, it has higher nutrition. So, yeah. Right. Awesome. Uh, before we get into the production, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear like where the product's going to. Is it just grocery stores in Ontario? Um, and then also, if you have any plans to expand beyond the current market that you're in. Right. Um, so our product is sold in major retailers. Uh, and the reason that we focus towards major retailers is the um, cost of production uh, to um, retailers allows us to be competitive in that marketplace. Whereas the um, restaurant trade or wholesale trade the margins aren't there. So hmm. my partner in this business is one of the largest produce wholesalers in the country. Uh, he can buy uh, right now. He said, Ian, do you want to just pack somebody else's lettuce under your brand? It's like, Steve, that's he was kidding with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but like, he can buy lettuce out of California uh, in the Lowe's for like a dollar a pound. Like, I can't get anywhere close. Like, yeah. our cost is like, is $3 a pound. So that's what the restaurant trade is after is low cost. And, uh, you know, the... Tim Hortons and the Wendy's of the world and all those guys are after low cost yeah. product, right? So uh, we just don't compete in that in that uh, area. They don't attach enough value to our product to pay us the premium prices that we need. Um, and the trade that is is such a small proportion of the market, like you know, the high high end dining. Sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so when you have this size of facility, when you have the volume that we can produce under this facility, we need big retailers to move that volume. Yeah. Um, and we've etched our market um, against all the competitors in the what's called the five deck sector of the grocery store because we are local and we are organic. There's lots of competition coming down the local path, yeah. but none of them are organic. And that's our only saving grace is that we have that quality, we have organic standards, and we are local. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and it's very difficult to be able to produce in, in quantity like this, doing it organically. Like m most people go the hydroponic path for a, a reason. reason. Yeah. It's been researched, it's been done. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, not, I don't wanna say it's easy by any means, it's not, no. like, it's very difficult. And there's been a lot of challenges in Europe and North America with the ver yeah. especially vertical farms doing mm -hmm. it. But uh, it's uh, a whole different ball game to do it organic. And then the market for organic is growing faster than the traditional yeah. just mm -hmm. ve veg market. Yeah. Um, so. There's a lot of good things going for you here, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, and for us, it's maintaining that shelf space, and that's the other thing about being in the CEA space is that, particularly to retail, is that you just cannot drop off the market. Uh, we yeah. have that dedicated space at those stores. We need to keep that full, and that's where the pressure comes from in my world. It's it's keeping keeping that pipe full. Yeah. Because uh, as soon as that pipe runs empty, the, those customers are looking for a replacement for you, right? Yeah, uh, and fortunately, we are in that organic space, so it makes it much more difficult for them to replace us. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, like I said, we're in all the majors, so the Sobeys, Metro, Loblaws, um, uh, and um, yeah, some of them are more interesting to deal with than others. But I'm, and, I, and I'm not naming names. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then in terms of uh, expansion, so it looks like, from what I can see, the greenhouse is pretty full. It if is not it, it, if that capacity. So how how does that? Kind we just out. we just reached capacity probably about two months ago. Uh, our latest and greatest is, as I was explaining earlier, is that we're actually about to implement a regrow program. Um, we had to set up some infrastructure to allow those tables to flow back out after harvest, and um, and we have to do a dedicated lane. It's very difficult to manage like four or five tables in this facility. Mm -hmm. It's got to be an entire dedicated lane. Yeah, We've recognized some nutrient efficiencies that we would run into in a second cropping cycle. So we're working on that formula as to how to get the nutrition in the back end of the crop. Yeah, the, Everything we do here, other than a few supplements of seaweed and yucca out in the crop, everything is built into the soil. So, And you got to be careful of high salts and yeah. your pH and yeah. uh, all the other parameters that uh, contribute to good growth. And so 
putting enough nutrition in to get it at the back end of that crop is not as easy as it sounds. So yeah, um, so especially with organics. Yeah, yeah. and th and that's that's what we're working towards right now. So that effectively would almost double our capacity yeah. uh, of throughput because you know this crop right here takes about twenty eight days. Uh, a recut only takes fourteen days. Um, wow. so, so like one and a half. Yeah, so it's one and a half yeah. times on the production wow, side. Wow, wow, yeah. that's really cool. Can you do that with arugula as well? Probably we, not. We're thinking about it. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, honestly, like, you, like, every time I come here, I'm just, like, blown away by the innovation that's going on here. It's, like, it's so inspiring and cool. Um, and, yeah, like, like, I'm really excited for people to see the automation you guys have. Yeah. One of the coolest things for me personally is this soil here is actually reused. So, you know, with microgreens and even just a lot of greenhouse production that does organic, the soil just gets tossed because it's very difficult to reuse it. There's the salt that accumulates over time. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, obviously you don't, if you're not growing the exact same crop, there's like weeds in quotes. Yeah. Um, and you can see a few that have popped up behind us here. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. And it just gets pulled out on the production line. So we don't worry about it out here. Yeah. We do it in the sanitary environment to make sure that there's no soil cross-contamination and that sort of stuff into the crop. Um, yeah, so this the facility, if we were not recycling our soil, um, would consume a million dollars in peat annually. Wow. Uh, so it's a huge cost. Yeah, um, yeah. So we developed, uh, initially that was the plan, uh, and then we started building a pile out back, and, and then we got the University of Guelph involved again uh, to do a research project with us to help us maintain the perfect compost conditions so that we could recycle that media back in yeah and we're in the midst of that research project right now so far we've been muddling along pretty good but we know we need to dial it but we do an awful lot of soil tests I to understand imagine. what exactly is coming into the facility how we need to adjust it uh what was happening last year is that we we're actually developing organic acids in the soil and our ph was plummeting from beginning to end down to like in the 4.4 wow. range the wow. crop was really suffering um and then that project started with the University of Guelph. They helped us through that issue by liming more. Uh, but now it's, it's about everything in this facility is all about policies and procedures. So now that we discovered we had a problem, we sample every single week, start and finish of the crop, analyze our compost inbound. Um, so we're, I think we do about eight to 10 soil tests every week. Wow. Um, that just gives us the data set uh, and Alice who hopefully you'll catch on camera, <laughs> who's my head grower, um, is uh, just a very talented spreadsheet manager, computer yeah. whiz, all that stuff. I get the fun job of experimenting and, and implementing. She gets the difficult job of trying to keep up with me. So. Um, so yeah, we have all kinds of super cool stuff around here. We take, you know, all our water comes from a, a large, I think 15 or 18 million liter pond out front that takes all the rainwater off the roof, puts it into storage. It's a bentonite clay lime pond. The unfortunate part about this location in Flamborough is that where our water quality is terrible. Uh, the ground, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's so full of hydrogen sulfide, you can't use it. And filtration systems for the volume of water we use is just way too expensive. So we installed, a, uh, it installed that pond and we solely rely on that water, wow. including all our potable water comes from that pond, but we have an Israeli technology that purifies the water Two potable water standards, um, just using dialysis membranes. Uh, right. We're the first one in Canada to have it. So it's uh, not reverse osmosis, it's something. No, else. Oh, no. interesting. Yeah, okay. it's actually sitting right over there. Uh, it's called a NUF system, huh. and um, so it makes I think ten about a cubic meter per hour, and so wow. we have enough storage on board or yeah, uh, yeah. in the facility to store that potable water for all our wash water or. or, or yeah. The plant. Uh, everything else that potable yeah, water is yeah. for. Yeah. And it includes filtering to potable water standards all the water that we use on the crop. Uh, because that's actually a, a standard of the um, Canada Gap. Oh, okay. So okay. All, all irrigation water has to be potable water standard. Yeah. So, so with the, the composting, um, which we'll show after, just one quick question I had is like, my, my understanding with this, like salts would eventually accumulate. In it, That's I, why we're so careful with sodiums. Uh, yeah. So all every input that comes into the facility gets tested for uh, soluble salts, uh, sodium, uh, chlorides. Yeah. Uh, so any of the, the nasties, we uh, the C we uh, C of A. So we got a C of A of every ingredient inbound to this facility. Wow. So that we know exactly what's coming in. Uh, yeah. Because if you don't, then all of a sudden you're running into a problem. Yeah. It's going to bite us, right? So yeah. 
and we've learned all those hard lessons. I can many imagine. Times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy how like you've been growing food uh, organically most of that thirty years, right? Yeah, about and, twenty-five of it. Yeah, and you're still learning like tons and tons of stuff yeah, every yeah. year. It, it's really cool. Um, I think you're driving the industry forward in so many ways. Um, and I hope this video will inspire people as well to like get involved in organics more so than hydroponics because yeah. I think that's really, uh, you know, that's, that's my passion is just like the quality of the food. Mm -hmm. And maybe one day hydroponics will be able to match what the symbiosis in soil can do. Mm -hmm. But it seems like we're pretty far away from that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, what I'm seeing is the latest great, like it's, we just had a sales meeting with a new a company that wants to supply us. And, you know, 10 years ago, these guys would have come to me and I, there wouldn't be anything in their catalog I, I could buy. Yeah. Uh, just because none of it met, met the organic standards. Today, the guy opened the catalog and he's got four pages of organic products and they're a chemical-based supplier to the Leamington area. Uh, and they've got four pages of stuff. Um, and a lot of it is now actually active bacteria and funguses. And that's the kind of cool, cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's happening. Like we ran into a bit of a pythium issue as the temperature skyrocketed here. And um, that's one of the other reasons I was in Holland is looking for the latest, greatest in trigoner uh, trigoderma yeah. species and bacteria and funguses to help us control that issue. Because if part of our pile uh, isn't composted properly, isn't rotated properly, or has too much moisture, and not enough moisture, then we don't necessarily reach the temperatures in the pile to control that disease pressure. Yeah. So this is an insurance policy uh to make sure that we stay on target because yeah. again that arugula did not look like that three weeks ago uh we had we, yeah we, arugula we had, is very prone yeah to, to, to pythium. Pythium. Yeah. so how, how did how like in terms of uh bacterial additives because i think a lot of microns growers would be interested in this as well it like what what, do you, what have you found is the most effective to add uh like that's allowed for organic production i'm guessing it's some sort of fungus or bacteria yeah so we use product. a lot of uh, a product called em1 and there's another company out there called terabiosa uh out of mississauga that we've actually just changed to okay because they're a local supplier yeah. um they produce a lactobacteria um and we brew that product here so um we buy the concentrate we brew it out with the additional molasses and all every crop in here is treated with that on a regular basis wow. it's actually in our Every one of the booms has dosatrons built onto them, yeah. and so that uh, I call it EM, but terabiosa this this week, um, seaweed, yucca um, are all applied to the crop on a regular basis, particularly at seeding when we first uh, seed. Yeah. So for yeah, anyway, that this and, just got watered in today. And so. then have you like have you found that like controls it like that keeps it at bay? It typically does. So you know. I can, one of the reasons that we ran into the pythium problem wasn't just uh, inconsistencies in compost. It was actually in a large irrigation system like this, you end up with biofilm in the pipework. Yeah. And biofilm is, it, it's not that it's harmful to the crop. It's, it's actually the mechanics of operating the booms. And so what happens is it plugs up our nozzles and actually it plugs the filters first, then it plugs the nozzles. And then we have to constantly clean our boom filters. So right now we're on a rotation of every single day cleaning our boom filters. Oh, wow. There's 28 of them in here. That's a lot of filters to clean. Yeah. And unfortunately, the way we plumbed it, the filters are up top. So our plumber's in, actually in today moving the filters down to the bottom of the so booms. It's easier. So it's easier to access them and stuff. Yeah. But So the lead up to the pythium was that we did a shock treatment of hypochlorous acid into our boom system. And the provider said that, oh, you can use this on the crop all the time. Lots of growers do that. It's under, you're allowed to use it on the organic certification. So we were using it for approximately, we did a heavy dose, clean the system out, yeah. and we we're running it at like one ppm uh, in our system to maintain that cleanliness. Yeah. And it was killing the biology in the soil. Ah. The, the accumulation of that chlor those chlorines were actually creating more of an issue for pythium than our natural habitat. Uh, that we encourage through the use of EM1 and the rest of the organic products that we yeah. utilize here, right? Yeah. So I've always I thought this has happened several times in my career that uh, you try and sanitize your, sanitize your way out of a problem while all of a sudden you're inviting more and more pathogens in to occupy that space. Yeah, so yeah, no, that it's good. Sense. It's good balance, and that's ultimately I relate organics to good uh, gut microbiome. Yeah, uh, exactly. plants are healthy if they have a good soil biome. 100 percent that's so. a very good analogy to use yeah. for people because yeah, i think people understand that better yeah because they have it in them yeah. and anyone that's ex like experienced any sort of 
GI issues with antibiotics and stuff like that, like we'll totally understand how important the biology of the soil is. Yeah. And then the food you eat, like the bact the EM bacteria, which are good for you, it's a lactobacillus yeah, bacteria, yeah. would in theory like be defending the plant on exactly. the surface as well, not yeah. just the roots. We have no powdery mildew. These crops are pretty susceptible to powdery mildew. We just have very zero. common on lettuce. Yeah, we yeah. have zero powdery mildew in this facility. Yeah. So. I'm sure the, the, the LED lights just turned on yeah. uh, in the winter months is when it's most prone to the powdery mildew. Actually, it's the spring and the fall. Oh, really? Yeah, Interesting. The early spring. Okay. Um, like now, we do have sulfur burners in case, uh, which is uh, you know allowed under the organic yeah. standard. Um, but you don't need them very often. Not very often. Yeah. 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 So if we run into a, a really dim week um, and then all of a sudden we break out into strong sunshine, then we'll see some powdery mildew uh, rear its ugly head. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, so those big climate changes. That, uh, yeah. Impact. Yeah. Like it was real hot a couple of weeks ago. And I can imagine that that's a challenge. In, yeah. In, in actually, here. the crop performed well through it all. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. We don't run into bolting issues. But when you're running 28 day crop cycles, um, it's less. Yeah. 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 So. And then the, the lights, um, are these the same ones you've had a few years ago? No. So we used to have a Helio Spectra test, uh, lights. And if anybody out there wants to buy some Helio Spectra, I got lots <laughs> of them. Uh, no, the problem with Helio Spectra, they just couldn't give us the power that we needed. So this light was actually the reason we selected it is most LED lighting systems that, and or high pressure lighting that get installed in a greenhouse, they end up putting Unistrut in this direction, uh, which actually creates even more shade in the greenhouse. Yeah, so by yeah. being able to utilize our trusses and still getting equal lighting across the profile was what made the decision. Yeah. And then funny enough, when I was in Holland, both uh, the seed vendors trials that I went to, both had the exact same fixture, so wow. uh, so okay. we selected well. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And you were saying, which is really cool uh, earlier, is that like there's almost no difference in the product quality from like this time of year, which is you know late June yeah. peak sunshine yeah. availability to like December, and and you know this is a pretty northern climate. Yeah. So that that's one that was one of the things that always led me to go to indoor vertical is the the technology when I started in 2013 didn't seem like it was really there. Also, the cost of operating a greenhouse. The start is more expensive than Absolutely. a vertical farm yeah. um, in a lot of ways. Uh, but one of the big challenges was the lighting wasn't really there. No. Like the LEDs were still very new. Mm -hmm. um, so you think that they're, they're pretty much there now where you can replicate in a northern climate year-round conditions? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Um, and again, being at the, the trade show in, in Holland, you know, the technology, these fixtures now are two years old, I think. Their efficiencies are getting a little bit better, but they're going to be very small, incremental. So I didn't want to make a decision on lighting until we had gotten to this point. Yeah, um, We needed that technology to be advanced enough so that I'm not making a huge capital investment and then replacing it in five years. Uh, I yeah. wanted to get 10 years out of these fixtures before I had to uh, update them. Um, and uh, there will be justification in 10 years to uh, update just because they have gotten that much more efficient. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And like the, the they won't burn out. That's one thing I know for yeah. sure yeah. is from, from my experience, we had lights that were supposed to have a life expectancy of like, I think it was 20 or 40,000 hours and we hit it. And I was like, Oh, these, and I realized it's, it's, it, that's the 70% efficiency of that's the light. Right. So they'll, it, it, in theory, they'll like last, no, I won't say indefinitely, but for a very, very long time. Right. But they are actually, you, are you getting the productivity out of your exactly. crop as that trend starts to occur? Yeah. Right? And yeah. that's where, like, if these things drop to 70% efficiency, there's uh we draw two megs of power in this place to drive these lights. Well, 30% of two megs is, is an lot. awful lot of that's energy. A, yeah. For it. Yeah. So, and then that plus the increase in efficiency over that 10 year period, period. you know, it could be 45% exactly. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have this huge cost savings that make the, and the LEDs will be less expensive than most likely, Absolutely. you know, inflation adjusted. But like, so yeah, that the, the technology has changed so drastically, yeah. but I, it's, it's cool to know that it's kind of matured now where mm -hmm. the, you know, it's gone really, really good. And it's going to be more slow incremental changes from here because that's right. At the beginning, it was like, like crazy like percentage I, I think, increases. Yeah, I think our ten years ago, maybe twelve. But I was, well, I, the, I saw the old farm of Mistova. We started playing with LEDs, um, and knowing full well that we had to have lighting if we wanted to be a year-round producer. Yeah. So we did a lot of experiments of tons of different light fixtures. Um, anyway. Yeah. Ultimately, it turns into this, right? Awesome. So, uh, and this is uh, actually. 
a Dutch-based company that is partnered with a Canadian manufacturer out of the um, Niagara region, and so service and um, customer support is incredible. So yeah, that's one of the main reasons we went with this fixture awesome. as well. So yeah, that's really it's definitely important. If uh, you know, I've had a bought from from uh, overseas, and then like the language barrier can be tough, and then also if like the power supply is really what I've seen goes in these things. So mm -hmm. you really need a well-designed power supply for these things to last a long time. Yeah. Like the LEDs themselves and like the heat sink, like, you know, I think that's, I, I don't want to say easier, but it's important. Uh, but in my experience with lower cost LEDs, I'm sure these are much more expensive and higher output yeah. uh, was the power supplies right. just were not built well. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was, seemed to be solved a long time ago right. now. Yeah, so maybe All let's right. go and check out production now. Yeah, so why we should probably go to the back end first. All right, so behind you is the composted soil that yeah. you use. Yeah, so yeah. Um, essentially this material is probably four months old uh, in static piles just outside the back. Um, so essentially when the crop is harvested, we have a ginormous vacuum cleaner system over there that I'll show you. Uh, vacuums the compost off the tables, delivers it to a bin, and then as loaders handle that product into windrows, and Derek, the guy that just walked by, he manages all those piles outside and he's actually gotten very talented at monitoring. He, you just get a sense and he's got that sense for taking care of those piles. Yeah. And that's key, obviously. Um, and then this is the same material that we'll take, analyze uh, every week before it goes back into production. Um, so this material makes up 80% of our mix and then we buy a pre-mix of a perlite peat based material that gets blended back in on our soil processing line. So yeah. we turn around here. And the, the reason for that, just so people know, is because over time, the peat moss will turn from a very porous material to something that's more like black earth. So just to get that porosity back, yeah. uh, you just kind of need to add in some fresh peat. But even still, like this is in and of itself, I think very revolutionary yeah. for the industry. So that's like really cool because you know, I, I actually had Promix on the podcast, um, and it was interesting to hear like how little PMOS we use. But having said that, it's still a carbon, like a porn carbon sink that we, like ideally, if we can not use it, yeah. it'd be much better yeah. the solution. Even if we're using a small percentage of what's available, it's still much better just to not use it and let that carbon be sink back into the earth. Yeah. Because we, we definitely, <laughs> we need that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and you mentioned Promix, uh, Premier Horticulture is a company yeah. that owns Promix and, uh, their quality of peat moss is terrible. I would never use them. We have used them in the past and they just can't get it right. Uh, especially at scale at like scale. we are. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe the, they're- Small growers. And the bales are probably fine, but- Yeah, yeah, the bales. They're, Lambert's probably a better choice of materials. Uh, Lambert or T T and H. Uh, for for the, 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 the tall bales. Or even just, their small bales. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, the problem is, is what they put in retail package size bales is their worst material because the, the average homeowner grower doesn't have a clue what good quality peat moss is actually yeah. supposed to look like, right? Yeah, yeah, no, for, uh, like, that's why I call like retail peat. Like, so Promix has, or Premier has Promix like potting soil in like loose bags. Yeah. Like that, that stuff I tell people not to use because that's like, if it's for retail, they're not gonna be, for, like it's gotta be a, like for professional growers. growers. Yeah. So even though like, HP, I've been using it in, in, in testing because a lot of growers use that. Yep. And it seems pretty consistent to me. I have heard yep. people say like there's extra perlite in there, less perlite, things like that. Right. Um, and it's like, it's better to buy PMOS on its own, but a lot of growers, if they're small enough, like they don't have soil mixing machinery, absolutely. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's just a lot yeah. easier to buy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's the challenge of being small, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You can't, you, yeah, you, you can't, can't get equipment like that. So yeah. yeah. Sure. So <laughs> this is the... Uh, uh, I guess it was back uh, eight, I guess uh, 10 years ago, I first met the gentleman, the owners of Logitech Plus, and we've actually become friends. Uh, been invited to go stay at his house in Spain, and uh, great company, great equipment, but it's big. It's right? big, yeah. Um, like we're capable of producing 15 cubic meters, no, 30 cubic meters per hour out of this line. 
Um, we're, I guess we're running about half speed. We're producing like 300, 400 cubic meters of soil per week. Wow. Um, so cubic it's meters, not cubic yards. No, cubic, cubic meters. meters. Yeah. So, wow. So this is a bale shaver. Uh, takes these skyscrapers, shaves the bale, automatically de delivers it onto the line. This is what we also call the dirty area because it gets dusty back here. Yeah, I can, yeah, um, I can imagine. But if you look down that line, you can see all the fertilizer dispensers, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, gypsum, feather meal, compost. Yeah. Uh, and it's all, all, it's all automated. Like you, yeah. you, you yeah, guys as soon as the sensor to... calls, it, that line automatically starts. Now this is main, this is a one person's full-time job. Wow. Just, just keeping that. this line running. Yeah. Uh, so filling all the bunkers and the hoppers and checking the calibration. So nothing's ever perfect and calibration is key to making sure that those fertilizer dispensers aren't going out of whack. So he's oh, checking yeah. probably minimum of every half an hour. Wow. To make sure that the weights are on target. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. is there any inconsistencies in the granulation, then it changes the discharge rates and all that stuff. And right? then also it affects the comp the ability to compost it because if there's too much in there it changes the whole yeah. like it's just it's the precision that's needed yeah to, so that to you maintain it work. all the way through the cycle yeah, right yeah we make small <laughs> incremental changes and then you know it's four months before we're seeing that change possibly re-enter our system right um, yeah. So, yeah um and how long did it take for you guys to develop the composting system to get it to i know it's still in the works like yeah. it's a ever-evolving yeah and actually we could just see if we just go out the side door here. And TH, who, I've never heard of this brand. Uh, yeah, they're Quebec based. You're in hatchery, hackery. Oh, interesting. Huh. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of soil. Okay. So each one, like, so they're all, so this one says March. March. So that was loaded, April. loaded March, yeah. April. Okay, uh, May. So, so this one would be the first one that's gonna. This is yeah, the one that's I think he's working next. on a pile, probably from be before that, uh, further down. Yeah. Um, so then he transports it all in by skid steer, uh, and we finally got to a track loader. Ultimately, we would like to pave this area, uh, collect the leachate off of the piles, and oh, recycle true. that back into the facility. Mm -hmm. um, but really what it needs is it needs an entire building so we can yeah. predict it. It's a whole other business. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it like, really is. What, what, what are the key, t like from your, your, your learnings on making good quality compost? Because I know we've had this conversation in, in years past yeah. about how hard it is to find good quality compost and how different it is all across the world, all across different cities. Each company has like their own like yep. different way and some skimp on the timing. And there's yep. so many. So like if someone does want to you know, try to compost their own soil, mm -hmm. like peat-based soil, what would be like the key takeaways that you've kind of learned? Oh boy. I know, so I'm sure it's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> yeah. It's, but like, uh, for like it's a smaller grower, like obviously, a, you know. Well, you know, and I've been at some small growers that did a really poor job of, and uh, you know, I don't need to name any names, but yeah. did a really poor job of actually composting their media thinking they were saving money. Yeah. And the reality was is that they were wasting more money because of the disease pressures disease. that they had. Right? I know exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's um, so, and, and you know, when we first started this project, we went out to the University of Guelph and said, you know, can you help us through this process? And yeah, it takes capital. Like I think we're spending fifty thousand dollars with the University of Guelph uh, this year alone. The government's funding two to another two thirds on top yeah. of that. Um, it's a good it, use of government money, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is very yeah. good. Oh, yeah. Um, we've got some great students. Uh, you know, one's got a master's, one's going for their, her PhD. Um, that is helping us through this process of understanding what we do or yeah. what we need to be doing. What we know of where we're at now is we're not achieving the kind of temperatures that we actually should mm -hmm. for composting. Um, and our carbon to nitrogen ratio is out, uh, so we need to get some more nitrogen into the mix. Um, it's, you know, understanding those temperatures, but yeah, we had the university, actually all their probes just got pulled out of our piles just last week. Like this thing was wired for oh, sound, right? Um, and they monitored it for, I don't know, almost six months. To, wow. And so we have all these graphs and charts, but ultimately the, the reality is, is that we just don't have enough N going in um, to get the heat. The piles uh, need to be bigger, pretty much. No, oh, we don't okay. have enough nitrogen. Um, oh, okay. The carbon nitrogen ratio is just yeah got to get it, the heat. Got it. Okay. So we've now supplied the University of Guelph with all our 
cost-effective nitrogen sources from alfalfa and feather meal and uh, those sorts of products yeah. uh, to actually do in-lab tests to, Amazing. to get the, to tell us how much exactly we need to add um, so we're not wasting it. So we have a predictable result at the end. Right? Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the toughest thing is like, especially if you if you have a compost pile uh, outdoors, it's at the mercy of like the rain, the temperature. Yeah. If it's indoors, in theory, could you like create a formula yes. for doing it? And then absolutely, like it was an indoor structure that was yeah. heated. And so kept we the same we already have the design, ah. the plans, the engineering done for an in vessel composting system uh, utilizing an overhead gantry crane that would literally you dump a pile in, and that gantry crane automatically manages it wow. until it's excuse me until it's finished. Um, but that's a million dollars spent. Yeah. Uh, is that, does it exist anywhere? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Uh, so the big peat companies in, in the Netherlands have done this all day long. Ah, okay. You just did like literally, that's the other advice I give to any newbie growers, get over to green tech, get to Holland, yeah. see the way these guys do this stuff because they are the technology leaders in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I did hear an interesting statement though, when I was there that Leamington has now beat them in kilos per square meter of tomato and cucumber wow. production just this past year. Huh. The Leamington is, uh, they're rocking it. Really? Wow. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. I haven't been down Leamington in a while. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Like, those guys are building a hundred acres. They don't, they don't even think about not building a hundred acres at a shot. It's insane. <laughs> like, but those guys are deeply funded by equity markets these days. Yeah. 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 It's all like, I, I know some people in, in, uh, uh, private equity, like land buyers and, uh, it's it's just it's all pure numbers game. Like they can get, if the numbers make sense, they get the funding. They can build whatever the hell they want, sort of yeah. thing, as long as the numbers make sense. So, uh, which is a good thing. But at the same time, again, it, like what is the quality of that hydroponic mass-produced food. food? And like I I personally haven't seen anything aquaponics hydroponic that really can match the quality of a good organic production yeah. system with soil yeah absolutely yeah i you know my other analogy i always use when i'm trying to describe organics it's like when was the last time you ate a really good tasting tomato from the grocery store when i and i say that they say yeah kind of they taste not bad and i said when was the last time you tasted a really good organic tomato grown in your own garden oh yeah they taste really good yeah right yeah, yeah. pretty simple stuff a right? hundred percent yeah, yeah. That, that's how i got started in, in farming is i I uh, brought uh, these cherry tomatoes to uh, that I grew in my backyard to the office I was working at, yeah. and just like seeing people's faces light up when they like, because some people have never tried a real tomato, tomato. as crazy as that yeah, sounds, you know. And uh, and then just giving them that experience, it was like beautiful, you know, just getting them to try real food that for the first time because they're just were born into the system of buying from grocery stores and just not really noticing the quality, especially in North America. I think other places in the world have a better focus on quality Absolutely. Than, than here. Yeah. Um, oh, I can so it makes it a little easier to understand what quality yeah. is. Uh, well, but that's yeah. why we still buy tin tomatoes from Italy, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. San Marzano's grown, grown well. Yeah. No, no, no. This is a drop tube. So oh, it's, it's a... actually got a sponge in there. This is the same seed they use in California, Arizona. Uh, it's actually developed in New Zealand. So okay. this would normally be mounted on a three-point hitch of a tractor. Uh, the difference is that we don't have we don't need a tractor. Yeah. So yeah. our cables drive through it, and then it actually has uh, revolution control. So then we can control seating density. Uh, okay. um, is it it's computer program? Uh, no, it just has a like PLC. And literally, like we couldn't get them to tell us the technology to how to turn it on and off remotely. So we had to come up with a pneumatic button actuated by wow. light sensors yeah. or uh, uh, sensors to yeah. tell it when to turn on and turn off. Because <laughs> um, normally it would be a guy in a tractor hitting start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we needed a start finger. <laughs> so so, so you, you can it just it's just that dial that's what adjusts the seating rate. Uh, seating rate is adjusted on. Oh, on there's, the a pro, there's a okay. There's yeah. a there's yeah. some sort of program yeah. that control like. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's not and complicated, it's just, but it's just the revolutions of a sponge hitting six drop tubes. Um, the Dutch wanted three hundred thousand, no, two hundred thousand euro to build me a cedar to seed these tables. This thing cost twenty five thousand euros. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I guess that, that's the advantage of having things that are already done. I always say, like, if you can buy something that exists, yeah, do it because trying to create your own thing, as I'm sure you've experienced with. The harvester yeah. and other things you've yeah. done uh, in the microns industry—it's like 
It's a lot of work. It is. And the money, and, it's not worth the money sort yeah. of thing. And yeah. it's a lot of experimentation. And, yeah, and time. Yeah. So, yeah, we had Sut Nag in California uh, just build the aluminum frame for us and ship it up. So Sut Nag um, is one of the largest farm implement suppliers to the salad green industry in California. Wow. Uh, so we also have a Bansar harvester that is the exact same harvester that would be used in the field without the tractor. Uh, so that's just inside that room there. Um, and it, it literally straddles the entire table. Table's driven underneath it. Yeah. And the conveyor belts take that product away. That's the one machine that we are looking at redeveloping um, into a rotating knife system. Uh, okay. And that's the other reason I was in Holland was um, there are manufacturers of a single gutter lane wide lettuce harvester, but it won't do what we need it to because we need it to straddle a 1.6 meter table. So we'll probably end up with really large blades and really wide and four of them uh, to try and harvest our tables. It, it's just a much more precise cut got it, uh, got with it. a rotating knife. And with the advantage is that it would, would it affect the shelf life or is there anything else? Uh, well, cleaner cut and also if we're doing the regrows, um, it would be because of the cleaner cut, uh, it just makes your regrow probably better. Uh, uh -huh. God, that makes yeah. sense. Okay, yeah. for so. regrowth, this is the main. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, yeah. But that is going to be a custom one-off machine because nobody else grows on these tables like we do. Although people are starting to pay attention in Hull, and the, yeah. enough of the consultants that have been here are thinking, yeah, I can imagine over. Yeah. 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 So, um, um, so this is the table filler. Again, a custom piece of machinery because no one's ever filled an entire table, table. profile yeah. with soil. What, so, so what are these? They're, they're bigger than 4x8. They're 4x12 or something? No, uh, 5x19. 5x19. Are, is this a standard table size? It all depends on the greenhouse width. So most mm -hmm. Dutch greenhouses are 21 feet wide. That's why the table's 19 to leave that two-foot walkway at the end of each table. Okay, so these are standard size tables? Yeah. Okay. yeah. If you have a different size greenhouse, then you can get different size tables. Got it. Got right. it. So, but, okay. so these tables were are flood tables and they were designed to handle pot culture. Yeah. So potted moms or African violets or whatever. The reason I bought this facility is um, it had the entire table system here. The facility was very tired. So we replaced the roof. We replaced the hydronic heating system. But the value of the tables and the table handling system uh, made the purchase price made complete sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we still continue to use the same tables and developing that uh, system to grow organically and have enough soil volume. It was actually a really good fit for us. Yeah, so. yeah. No, like the, the crops look amazing, yeah. how uniform they're, they're growing with this system. Yeah. And like, then you don't need as much soil depth. Right. Um, the on short and, crop, crop cycles. Yeah, right? yeah. For, so. you know, if you're growing tomatoes, it wouldn't, definitely no. wouldn't work. But no. um, yeah, that's cool that you were able to like, you know, that, that's always, I find that's the best way to do it. If there's something that exists, then uh, if you can slightly modify it or use, use it, it. Yeah. you know, but, but this machine uh, that fills them, that's a custom made machine because n no one fills these things with soil, exactly. at least for now. Yeah. 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 So yeah. again, Logitech plus their soil processing line, we just had to add an extension and then it uh, drops down into the table and Luanda, our, our seating person, she controls all those speeds and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. um, and this little gizmo here is just to flatten the soil out on the way by. So, ah, okay. Okay. Um, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then how, like how, how long does it take for you guys to get through? Uh, like I'm guessing it's running five or seven days a week. I uh, know we only run four days a week, four days a week. Wow. So we got all our production done in four. We run slightly longer days and we went out to our staff and said, listen, we can get this done in four. Yeah. It might turn into a 10 hour day, but you get an entire day off per week. Yeah. Same number of hours. What do you like? What do, well, what do you think? And they're like, Sign me up. Yeah, I think so, most people would want yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they uh, t they don't work Mondays. That's amazing. Um, so you get a three day weekend. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I so. think I think I think you got a new employee here. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's so, amazing. Yeah. That's, that's so, so we good. see Luando tomorrow or sorry today we'll probably do 120 tables. Wow. Um, I think we're seating about 400, 420 or 440 tables a week, uh, and we're harvesting 440 tables a week. Okay. Uh, so this place is like a big circle. Yeah. Outbound, inbound. So they cut, they'll come in through here. They come in through the wall here. Oh, uh, the wall there. Okay. And then they come on All there. through there. Okay. And there's a harvester just on the other side of that wall. Got it. Got it. And then this is a cut table that's about to go into the vacuum system. So there's a ginormous vacuum over there. Uh, that's, what, what's the vacuum? It vacuums all the compost up. Oh, whoa. Yeah. So we wow. developed that machine as well. 
so that, that you have to create that. So it's actually, we brought a sucker truck in here to figure out how to get the compost <laughs> off the tables um, because these tables aren't heavy enough to actually dump the table. Oh, uh, interesting. And um, so, and then even after you dump the table, then you're still going to have a lot of residual to, yeah, 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 yeah. to get off. So we actually brought a sucker truck in from uh, locally and had them set up at the back and try it out. Yeah. And the, the problem was that that sucker truck had so much horsepower. It, it was like sucking the, the entire table, table right off. Yeah. <laughs> so we, the same company that provided that the sucker truck gave us the contact information for the, for the gym or manufacturer. And this was actually an off the shelf piece of equipment that they used for sucking the ballast, the rocks between railroad ties. They put an excavator on the rails with that thing called a tin bin. I don't know why they call it a tin bin, but anyway, so they literally suck the ballast out and then they can punch the railroad tie out. Oh, and these things are all over Europe and the, the huh. Canadian distributor is actually getting a lot of traction with them. Uh, but it sounds like a jet engine taken off. I, can, I was going to say, yeah. I can imagine it's got to be yeah. really loud. Yeah, it is. If it's and lifting so, yeah, up like rocks and like big rocks. Yeah. 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 So it vacuums up our compost and then anyway, well, let's walk over yeah. and you can kind of see it. That's smart. Cause yeah, clean, like, even on small scale microgreens farms, I see like you're brushing it, you're trying to suck it up with like a little vacuum. Like it's it's time consuming to clean flood tables. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a big thing when people start automating. They're like, they're, we go from cleaning trays to having to clean flood tables. Yeah, and flood tables are much harder to maneuver to to clean them. Yeah, than, you, than a ten by twenty tray. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So the, there's a whole drive system here that captures the table. And then automatically indexes it as the vacuum goes back and forth. Uh, then oh, it wow. gets accumulated in the bin. And then after that cycle, the doors open on the bottom of the bin, the conveyor belts turn on, and all the all the wet compost material is transported outside to a bin that allows the skid steer to come in and pick that material up and then transport it out to the piles. Wow. So, so this is this on a uh, is this manually controlled or is it's on it's a all automatic? Okay. Yeah, it's on a, uh, so it's, what, did you have to custom make that or was yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. That so, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So we had, uh, we, we had an engineering firm out of Niagara, um, gave them the, uh, the problem and they came up with a solution. Yeah. But that was six months in the works. Right? I can, I can like yeah. just this one thing, solving this one problem can be quite difficult on its own. And you think about like, you have, this is just one s small stage yeah. and the, this is just getting the soil off of the trays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's crazy. There's so, there's so much equipment that's needed to make an efficient automated, automated system. system. Yeah. yeah. And the, again, the fun part of my job is I get to invent this stuff and come yeah. up with the concepts, but sometimes it can get frustrating, especially when you spend the kind of money we spend on this sort of stuff and then it doesn't work and then you got to figure out a workaround. Yeah. Uh, like this machine, it wasn't terribly reliable in the beginning and they, you know, working with good companies, they updated it and got it working for us. Yeah. Right? So that's good. Um, and then, it, so, you know, this, this is our table washing system. This was all here when we purchased the facility. The crane, uh, wherever the crane is, there's a crane that comes yeah, in, I saw it earlier. Yeah, picks yeah. up the table, puts it in the washer, washes it, and knows where to put a clean stack, uh, and just keeps the entire process operating. Yeah. Normally, these stacks are all full of uh, tables. Yeah. But yeah, no, it, it's it's crazy. It's like a uh, it's like a Tesla factory here, but for, <laughs> for growing for plants. plants. Like, seriously, because I've been to the Tesla factory, and it's just robots moving things around and it, like i'm sure i'll see that when, when once it's running but yeah. just seeing that i'm like that's what it reminds me of it's using yeah. it's a manufacturing process to grow like using that mindset that, to absolutely. automate uh and manufacture even though you're still growing plants but using the mindset of manufacturing yeah. uh and manufacturing like I ideology on how to make this as efficient as possible okay. yeah because the more efficient it is the cheaper you guys can produce high quality greens right. that will fit and ultimately people. again we our biggest competition is still California. Yeah. Right. And we have to compete against those tractor trailer loads coming up from California, which it's a little irritating. After yeah, no, a while. I can, I can imagine. But, uh, like, you know, you go in the winter to a grocery store, that stuff does not last very long. No. Like sometimes it'll be like a day or two after you buy it, the expiry dates like a week out and it just goes bad Yeah. because it's, it's, there's so many cold chain drops and, and like how much time it takes. Mm -hmm. Like my understanding, it's like five to seven days in transport. Yeah. In transport. The other California. reason that California greens deteriorate as rapidly as they do is because they use a nitrogen gas flush system. So they, that clamshell before that lid gets put on it or the film seal gets put on it, they use a, a copious amounts of nitrogen to flush the oxygen out, then seal the clamshell. 
This machine that's sitting right here is actually a top seal system and it has a nitrogen gas flush system built into it okay. for that purpose. So it, what it does is it takes all the oxygen away, which then doesn't allow the product to deteriorate. So as soon as you open that clamshell, uh, the nitrogen goes out of it, the oxygen goes in, and then the rot process, it, and it's like prone. It looks great when that package yeah, is closed. Yeah. As soon as you open it, oxygen gets in and it turns to it. That's smart, but also deceivious because like people think they're buying something fresh, but it could last longer because it doesn't have yeah. the oxygen to break right. down and start decomposing. But once you open it up, if it's eight days old, it's still eight days old. Days old. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, yeah. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, this is our latest, greatest project, which is a, a top seal. So we currently use a hinge clamshell. Yeah. And because of all that extra plastic, the clamshell is expensive. Uh, so we are going to a top seal system, which yeah. will actually reduce our packaging cost by 50%. And do you have to, and it'll put nitrogen in, in as well? We can, if you we want don't to. need to. Yeah, yeah, because right? the so, shelf looks so good. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. do some experiments with Let's it. see if it helps. But like, do you really want to be buying a package of salad greens that has a 30 day best before date? Eh, maybe not. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know what's funny is uh, there's a lot of juice companies now that are uh, like, I don't want to name any names, but like they, like I know that they UV sterilize it. Yeah. Which, it, you know, it's good, it's, like, it's sterile, which can be good if there's any pathogens and stuff. But the, like you look at the best before date, you're like, how is this lasting three months or four months before it goes bad? It's literally fresh, fresh juice. juice. And it's just, it's this, I, and, and so, so interesting because I didn't know that. And hearing that, I'm like, it's kind of the same thing in a way. Yeah. It's like a way to preserve yeah. uh, just without chemicals in a way. It's just using yeah. like what's in the air, but it's a way to preserve the product. Uh, but it's, it, it makes total sense when you open it yeah. that it's going to go bad because it, it's that old already. Yeah. So we technically should not go in here, but we're gonna sneak in. Uh, this is the harvester. The harvester straddles there. You can't see the bandsaw in the front of it, but that's the back end of the harvester. Got it. And then this is a knocking uh, belt that knocks off any fine particles off the product. This section here is actually designed for a Raytech optical sorter, but if we ever needed to sort out yellow leaves or any of that sort of stuff, that would happen there. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and then the next piece of equipment is sort of our piece of resistance, and I'll explain that when we get out of this room because it's really loud in here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a sanitation tunnel. Ah, okay. So we'll uh, I can see the UV. Yeah, yeah, I can see the UV. So it, uh, UV, hydrogen peroxide, and ozone. So it's U, sorry, you said it was UV? So it's UV, hydrogen peroxide, and ozone. Wow. And okay. those three, the, the UV actually uh, kicks those two products into uh, nanoparticles. And it, all this research was done at the University of Guelph. And that it's, it's um, like we get a three log kill of any bacteria on our product because we do not wash our product. Yeah, yeah. That step, because we grow so clean, yeah. there's no need to wash. And washing actually deteriorates the product. Um, you know, if you think about the California guys and Arizona guys, they're using so much chlorine in their water. That's the other reason the product doesn't last very long because they've actually damaged the product because they have to use so much chlorine. Yeah. Otherwise, they get all kinds of infections. And the flavor, like chlorine, doesn't taste good. No. Yeah. No, exactly. It it, it get like water gives an off flavor, and then you can sometimes tell when something's been treated. Yeah. With chlorine, it has like like a more chemically taste, taste. to it. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So this system was developed by Paul Moyer at Moyer Apples in Niagara on the Lake, or Niagara Falls, Niagara, uh, for candied apples. He's in a very large uh, producer of candied apples, and in the U.S. they were having listeria. He wasn't, but U.S. producers were having listeria issues. Uh, so he actually won the Premier's Agricultural Award runners up to us uh, for introducing this is 2018 for introducing microgreens to the. To the public in Ontario. Yeah. So he won second place um, for we, this, for that wow. machine. That's cool. And, yeah. Um, but we did our validation with the University of Guelph. He had a test unit at the University of Guelph. They took our product, infected it with listeria, ran it through the tunnel, and proved that they get a three log reduction and that we cannot get contaminated as long as we obviously we maintain yeah. the equipment. Yeah. Um, so that gives us. Great food safety protocols. I can imagine. And, yeah, and uh, so we we can be confident that we're selling good um, non or contaminated product. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know if you anyway. I'll give a quick history. Twenty eighteen, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency said I had listeria. 
And if Paul and I had met at that point, then uh, I probably could have peddled my way out of the Yeah, um, yeah it was very unfortunate. For people that don't know, Greenbell Microgreens, which was the company prior to Greenbell Organics, uh, did just microgreens, and they were like the biggest microgreens grower, I think, in the world, in the world. which is yeah. like crazy. Yeah. Um, and then there was that, like uh, a, a quote unquote outbreak. Did you ever find out what the cause was? No. And so, and so the but no one, no one ever got sick, right? No, no one got no, sick. No one got sick. No. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Um, but the, you know, essentially, they made us do three recalls, and once you have that number of recalls, then your customers lose confidence. Yeah. In you. Yeah, but yeah. the major retailers lose confidence. And because we didn't have a root cause, we couldn't fix what we didn't know or we couldn't find. Yeah. Only the CFIA could find it. The Ontario government couldn't find it. Our independent labs couldn't find it. Uh, and then I've heard through the grapevine that the CFIA has the dirtiest labs in the industry. So has, eh, been, has dirtiest labs uh, in the industry. Yeah. From former like, employees of the CFIA. Yeah, that's so. unfortunate. Because like in theory, like if you wanted to put someone out of business, that's one way to do it absolutely not no conspiracy theories but just like that it, it the fact is it is yeah uh but th that that like ozone in and of itself is a good sterilizer uv in and of itself is a good sterilizer hydrogen peroxide maybe not as good, good. like it, yeah. it, it's good but like in and of itself it's not perfect but the three of them together that's like so incredible i said well it's creating nanoparticles that's not true it's a creating free radicals Ah, and the okay. free radicals are doing the kill the of like any the bacteria or funguses or any of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's what gives us a really good shelf life is because we're going into that package pathogen free. Yeah. And there's no rot because it's not just uh, human pathogens we're concerned about. It's, it's rot pathogens to the plant. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Very so, cool. Okay. Very so we'll cool. go in another door here before they fire this lineup. You can get a view of the balance of it. We're not going to technically go in. I'm just going to pull the doors. This is the packaging room. Sorry? This is the packaging room? Packaging, yeah. yeah. So essentially after the CleanWorks system, it gets elevated. This is their cooling tunnel. The cooling tunnel drops the product down to four degrees Celsius before it's elevated up to the multi-head layer. And then you can see the clamshell dispenser. And then they start, uh, automatically dispenses 142 grams. Um, and then the girls, the girls tuck it in, yeah. uh, just to make sure that there's no leaves hanging out in the seal. And um, yeah, we're just coming back from lunch, and you can see product being fed up on the top of the conveyor. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's supposed not, to. Yeah, that's it's standing up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. It looks like a, from a distance, it kind of looks like a like, a, like some sort of like dragon. Like oh, I, yeah. I see like a yeah. body and then like a face yeah. uh, and then the neck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is this is like insane. I can't imagine how fast this must be. Like, so it's just one person that operates the whole. Package. Well, no, there'll, there'll be five people in here. Okay. Um, okay. Between handling all the clam gels, the harvester, and then on the other side, there's a way checker, label application system, yeah. uh, all the rest of the technology. Okay. And how many how many clam shells are you guys uh, putting out per day, roughly now? So we can produce 40, our line speeds here, or we're all designed for 40 clamshells per minute. Um, wow. We probably run 35, 33, 33, 35. And that's going all, all day? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we have some products that we have to back blend. We have to pre-harvest, call it arugula, to yeah. back blend with the lettuce. Yeah. Um, so that part of the production line ends up slowing down. So yeah, if you wanted to average that, it's probably 30 time shows a minute. Um, and then, well, you can see them traveling across. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And that goes to the boxing line, I'm guessing? Yeah, we'll show, the, we'll yeah. show you the boxing line. Yeah, so. very cool. So yeah, you can see the, the little packages of uh, salad going across the building. Very cool. And then in here, So once, once the product is cut, it's not touched by anyone. Nope. Wow, that was, that was cool. Even just the sound, it sounds yeah. it's like an electric car. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. 
So I, did you? Yeah, is that a recent purchase? You've had it for a while. Uh, that's about maybe a year and a half. Oh, we've okay. had it now. Um, you know, keeping up to, as I said to my partner, my my cat, as well as my capital partner, um, that. You know, every we have to look at what, just whatever the bottleneck is, and he completely yeah. agreed. Yeah. And I said, you know, to keep up to forty clamshells a minute, uh, building a box, taping a box, getting the clamshells yeah. in, that's that turns into five people. Wow. So that machine, like the way handles, that room replaces five people. Yeah. Wow. So the girl still like we could. Yeah, you, there's still some. People j just her stacking. You know, our next robot will probably be. A boxing or a palletizing robot where there's a robot that picks the box up and sticks it on a pallet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if, yeah, if we got to, you know, if we double the foot, footprint by regrowing the crop or 1.5 times what we're outputting, then we're, we're going to need that kind of equipment, right? Yeah. Um, just because, you know, it's that girl has to work in that cooler all day long. Yeah, it's right? quite, it's, that, that's another thing that you, people may not realize is that. It's uh, it's refrigerated in there. Yeah. So, but this is not where you store the product. This is, or it is where you store the product yeah. as well. So uh, this okay. gets stored for shipping, so and then it's picked up every day. I'm guessing. Yeah, four, pretty four much. Days, four days. Five a week. days a week. Five days a week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, five or six. Yeah. So we store all our packaging so that the clamshell is cold oh, before smart. we load it. Interesting. Um, the box is cold yeah, so yeah. that we don't break the cold chain in our facility wow. at all. Right. I never even thought like what a, what a smart idea because if you have a warm clamshell. Yeah. And you have cold, but like there's going to be some condensation for me. Yeah. Just from the clamshell itself. itself. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting, especially this time of year when it's yeah. more humid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, I never even thought about that. Is, is that is, like, how did, how did you figure these kind of things out? Uh, just go, it's just like well, no, it, it, it's just what should be the right process and procedure. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. are, we're taking warm, you know, we had all these clamshells sitting out here and they're sitting at ambient temperature and yeah. now we're taking them into a cooler. Yeah. Well, we have enough cooler space. Let's put them in the cooler. Right, that and then actually, sense. then we find out that that's actually the protocol that all the lettuce packers in California use. Ah, right. So yeah, um, yeah. wow, amazing. Yeah. And then here is again, technically, we're not really supposed to be going here. Yeah, this is uh, this is the the labeling, labeling, area. and weight checking, and metal detection. Uh, next step, Preston will probably put in X-ray. Uh, that's just to make sure there's nothing, no yeah. contaminants at all. And that's just a food safety thing, right? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's actually funny. I was, um, I had some ta like chickpea pasta the other day, and I was cleaning the plate, and there was a piece of like hard, hard, it felt like steel. Right. Really? And I was like, if I bit into that, I would have broken too. Yeah. So it's something that you, you don't think about when you're on a small scale because it's not really practical to be able to rent that kind of stuff. No. But here, it's actually really important because yeah. like you're producing so much food yeah. that the odds eventually, like metal will end up from the blade or a yeah. screw comes out. That's why the metal detectors are yeah. there, right? Yeah, really smart. Amazing. Very cool. I realize that like product quality with food is number one. Like Absolutely. people are not going to buy your product if it's not high quality. Yeah. Like if you're, if that's the market you're going for, if you're trying to go for price, that's one thing. Yeah. But if you're trying to go after the market that uh, wants high quality product, but the actual like packaging's beautiful and it looks really cool. Yeah. And maybe even uh, like the, the product visually looks good, but it doesn't taste good. Yeah. People aren't going to like, people won't repeat purchases. Yeah, it's exactly. like the most important thing. And I think a lot of people in the, the industry like lose sight of that yeah. because it, it's like they want people to see it in the store or investment money or whatever yeah. it is. But the product itself is the most important thing. It is. It's what you're producing. It's what people are consuming. Yeah. And I learned this lesson like very early on uh, at selling at farmers markets. Like if I saw, if it, let's say there was a tomato and it wasn't like, you know, like the quality wasn't good for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I would still bring it. But like people, if it doesn't taste good, people, those people, you, you're actually doing a disservice because those people not only uh, are, are having a bad experience, but they're not going to come back and buy yeah. it again. That's right. So that was a very early lesson I learned as well. That's the only thing, the only reason I've succeeded or or even or I'm even still here in this industry is because quality is everything. Uh, as long as you have your quality, you will always have customers, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, we supply the biggest chains in the industry and they they are supporting us because their customers are buying our product. And the only reason they repeat buying it is because it's quality product. Yeah. So, yeah. A very simple formula to success. Yeah, cost of productions are one thing. There's lots of other issues, but sure. as long as you are outputting quality, 
you're not going to have you're going to have a customer right yeah now, so yeah, yeah. that's uh, i think that's a, a important takeaway mm. from seeing this incredible facility you yeah. have thank you so much ian for, yeah. for showing the facility i think this will inspire many many people yeah. to want to get in the industry uh and, and get interested in automation and, and technology and how it can apply to, to agriculture yeah. and more maybe more important than that is creating a high quality product yeah. that uh, will actually contribute to the health of, of people yeah absolutely. Um, which is really cool so thanks so much for having yeah, me absolutely if uh, if anyone wants to uh, uh, know, learn more about greenbelt and uh, yourself is there greenbelt organic dot uh, ca um, and buy our product at retail yeah the website's yeah. on there no, I, can, I could definitely I highly recommend the product I've, <laughs> I've it's my it's my go-to salad green. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, I, and I generally believe in the product that you're that you're growing here. So uh, it makes me happy to, yeah. to to buy it every time and and know that I'm like what I'm eating, what's going into the soil is like a, the highest quality salad greens that with the current knowledge we have can be produced. Yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, that is yeah. cool. Awesome. Um, and if you do buy our product uh, and do enjoy it, please do comment on our website because I actually take comments from our website. There's actually one posted over on the wall there for my staff of, um, and actually if you take a picture of it, it's, it's actually a great testimonial. I take the comments that come in on our website and I actually send them to the executives of every one of our major chains that's that amazing. buys our product because that's the only way we get the shelf space and that's the way you support local. Yeah. And supporting local is really important to support all the jobs that we have, uh, people that we have employed here. Right? Yeah, so, 100%. Yeah. It's a cir circular economy and it's really important, particularly in agriculture, that you support our products. Right? So, For sure. Yeah. 100%. Awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, okay. Ian. Yeah.